Welcome to Four Calling Birds. I'm Hayley Clapham and I'm your host for this episode. Season 2, Episode 4. It's a bit of a special one this week. Cast your minds back to Season 1 and our adoption story with Sarah. Now, if you haven't heard that one, pause right now and go back and listen. You don't want any spoilers. And then come right back to us here on this episode. This week, I've chatted to Sue, Sarah's birth mum. I'm so grateful to Sue for giving up her time to talk to me. Two halves of a gorgeous story. It's a really beautiful one this week. It really is such, such a beautiful story. And it's so nice hearing from Sue from the other side of the story. Often you don't get to hear um, both sides of it. And it's just such a lovely, wholesome, complete, beautiful story. I know. I, I, can't, I can't wait to hear it because I, I just, I mean, Sue, Sarah's interview finished me off as it was. Mm. I mean, it, it was just beautiful, but it was so, it was a very uh, happy, positive tale of adoption. And I know, I know that not everyone is as lucky. And um, I know, I know from listening to Sarah's interview, the relationship she has now with Sue is a, is a one in a million. Um, so to, we're so privileged, actually, to mm. have an interview with um, a, a woman who has been adopted, but then to have their birth mother on um mm. to find out the whys and the who's and the what's and i'm i'm really feeling quite emotional about it like i, I know that you i know <laughs> that you struggled Haley. i was really um, emotional yeah. and um yeah so oh should we should we dive in yeah <laughs> I can't wait. honestly i think it. we're all going to be in pieces when we come back <laughs> I think so. <laughs> In season one of Four Calling Birds, we spoke to Sarah and she told us all about her adoption story and her journey finding and meeting her birth mum, Sue. And for this episode, I'm honoured to say that I'm chatting to Sue and this is her story. In Sarah's episode, she talked about searching for you and then she sent a letter via an adoption charity to an address that she had found for you. But you had just moved out of that address and you were going back to pick up some old post and and the letter was there waiting for you. Can you tell me how you felt in that moment receiving the letter? Um, Well, it was my last trip back to the house to collect the post and it was amongst a lot of circulars. And I scooped it all up, put it in the car, went back to the other house, sorted through it, opened the letter and... um, I didn't know what to do with the information, really. So strangely, I, it was my day off from the hospital and I drove to work and met a friend, told her the story that, you know, I'd got Sarah, I'd given her up and gave her the letter to read to me. So right. <laughs> she was crying. So I was then crying, read the letter. And it wasn't something I... I did hope for it, but I think having given Sarah up for adoption, I didn't feel that it was my right to expect it. Mm -hmm. So the words were there um, and um, I I could assimilate it. But at the same time, I thought it can't be real. There must be another Sarah. This can't have happened in this way. Um, And my friend who was with me at the time was like ring ring now ring now but it was like 12 o'clock and so I waited till the evening to ring the mediator and who he was just so lovely had a voice like velvet um Mm. and I was I have a verbal diarrhea when I'm nervous and so I gabbled a lot of stuff at him and he was like take a breath and um have you got a drink and shall I ring you back um, I'd had to leave a message with his wife first. So there were quite a few hours where I just thought about the whole thing and couldn't believe my luck. Oh, it, that's amazing. It was beyond all my hopes, really. It it was just outstanding. And, and then he said he'd get in touch with Sarah. Um, and eventually we had the call together. And it's a little bit like... Um, like before your wedding, you're told to enjoy every minute. You know, mm. it'll all go really quickly and you you need to uh, sort of be in the moment. And I, I couldn't be in the moment. I, it was just overwhelming. The whole thing was just overwhelming. And to hear her voice for the first time was, I, 
on the one hand, I wanted to listen to what she was saying. On the other hand, I couldn't understand what she was saying. <laughs> it was just so overwhelming. And how um, much and t- I- how much time was it between uh, you speaking to the mediator and and then actually speaking to Sarah? I can't actually remember. I think it was only a few days. I seem okay. to remember it was only a few days. You know, I was a nurse and so life was busy. So I didn't have too much time to think about what I was going to say. And, you know, mm. but you do you do run a sort of script, don't you? I'll say this, she'll say that. You yeah, know. yeah. And mm. I think I, my big concern was that she might be angry. Yeah. And um, I spoke to the mediator about it and he said, she's not, she's not angry. But that was my overwhelming fear, really, was that she would be angry about it all because the... The one thing you hope for when you give a child up for adoption is that you've made the right decision for the child. Mm-hmm. And I'd met Sarah's parents and um, thought they were lovely. That's all you all you can hope for mm. is that you've made the right decision and that um, your child doesn't feel rejected. That it it all went well. Do you know what I mean? Mm, that it, course, it's yeah. the right decision for her. That she's had a good life. So. Not being in the moment, I think it was possibly quite natural. But I was desperate to listen to everything she'd got to say. But she's so easy to talk to mm-hmm. that sort of within minutes, a lot of that had passed, um, and and it settled into a nice conversation. And she sent me a photograph um, of her. I think she was on holiday, um, and I I couldn't get enough of the photograph. I I just couldn't stop looking at it. Because the picture I had in my head was when she was six weeks old. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was quite a different picture. Um, yeah, so it was it was overwhelming, exciting, and gosh, all those things all in one. Over the years, did you ever have anyone that you confided in that knew that you had a child that you'd relinquished at birth that you could speak to about how you felt or... Um, only my sister, because I grew up in a house of secrets, so um, we didn't talk about it. I was yeah. told not to tell anyone. My grandmother never knew. Right. Um, so only my sister. I did tell my son's father before we got married. Yeah. But obviously that wasn't something he wanted to particularly discuss. So she's always been alive and kicking, if you like, with my sister. Yeah. But there was nobody else because the the shame of having a child back then was overwhelming Mm. you know it's not something anybody of my age group has ever discussed with me either really even now even now there was there was no one and yeah I mean my sister was around at the time of Sarah's birth um and so she was the only one really that made it real yeah yeah, because when you hide something for so long, it almost becomes not real. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, my sister was the only person. And thank goodness that you had your sister. That you yeah. it must have been um, quite a lonely time. It would have been even lonelier if it wasn't for her. Children um, that search for their birth parents or their the first mother, as it's often called, often say that it helps them understand who they are, their place in the world, like a, a jigsaw, a piece of a jigsaw clicking into place. Is that how you felt when you when Sarah um, found you? Yeah, it it almost felt like I hadn't breathed out since she had gone. And so her coming back into my life felt like a massive sigh of relief. Yeah, it, it felt like I could, um, it felt A, that I could be on it with the children with my sons um um my friend who came with us for that very first visit because I'd never told her yeah um it felt the most honest I'd ever been really since um since she was born so it felt like breathing out and I hadn't realized how how tight I'd been about it all I I felt like I dealt with it did you feel no. like your, your shoulders had sort of gone down and yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the, the heaviness from your chest had disappeared almost? Yeah, exactly that. And I thought I dealt with it, 
you know, I thought it, it ran along parallel with the life I had, but actually it, it obviously has a huge impact on you. And I always wished her a happy birthday in diaries or, you know, that sort of thing. But the fact that it was all secret and then it suddenly wasn't was just, yeah, relief, I think. Incredible. That we could all start being honest. Um, and you've got a family of beautiful boys. How did you tell them? Um, Sarah said in the first episode that um, we'd had quite a lot of bereavements. And so it felt during that eight month period when we, we lost um, family members that every time we met up, I was telling them about another death. Mm. So I met them in a pub and um, coming from a home where there's a lot of secrets, I've always done the open thing. So I'll tell them all together. Um, and literally their first words were, who's died? Mm. And, um, and I, I, you know, I said, no one's died. Um, but before you were born, I had a, a daughter and gave her up for adoption. And they, they're not judgmental men. And so they were just really interested. And I was quite tearful, I think, and, and they're quite protective. So there was a lot of, it'll be all right, mum, you know, um, are we going to meet her? And, and then we've all got quite a, I don't know, slightly offbeat sense of humour. So then it was like, you know, is there only one? Um, you know, is there a pack of them? Um, more secrets. So it was it was easier to tell them than I'd gone through the script in my head. In yeah. the card down, down, I was going to say this, they would say that. Mm -hmm. And actually it was nothing like that. I'm a bit of a blurter. So it just sort of came out. Um, but But they... They adore her, so it's never been a, a problem, really. Oh, that's, was there was there anyone um, that it was very difficult to tell? Um, probably my best friend because we had we had no secrets, so she knew about my childhood, mm -hmm. and um, she'd been through my divorces, and we'd shared a lot of stuff, and and so I think to tell her that I'd carried this secret mm. for quite a long time was felt a bit disloyal mm -hmm. um but again she was blown away by it and I think she said that she was sad that I'd never been able to tell her but I think with a lot of secrets you don't feel always safe to tell people mm -hmm. and because of the stigma back then I, I wasn't I mean I think I would misjudge people I I don't know what I expected their reaction to be but I was fearful of it Mm -hmm. So it felt safer to not tell people. And then and then you're just busy, aren't you, getting on with your life and mm. and then finding that opening to suddenly say something. And and also because giving a child up for adoption adoption, I felt anyway, I had no right to expect mm. anything from her. So it might have been a secret that I shared but there'd be no no follow-up you know mm. I didn't know if I'd ever see her again so I think it it just felt like it would be half a thing to tell people and so I I, I chose not to yeah and that moment when uh, you and Sarah first met yeah I mean the journey up there I don't remember at all it's about an hour and a half I don't mm. remember getting there I remember my friend bursting into tears and hugging her and um and and worrying a little bit for her because we were going to sort of leave her she was going to walk around the town and uh, when I met Sarah and I remember in a sort of um stepping out of yourself sort of way thinking you need to drink this in because because at the time you don't know there's going to be any more so I remember thinking I need to really look at her and then thinking you need not to stare at her because that is just going to be really off-putting um so we we walked to this um restaurant um and I think she also mentioned that we can both be a little bit uh clumsy and my main thought really was please don't fall over <laughs> You know, don't walk into the door. Um, but I wanted to drink it in and I wanted to be present because there might not have been anything in the future. Yeah. You have no 
right to expect anymore. I mean, we might not have got on. I mean, knowing her, and who doesn't get on with her? I mean, it's a crazy <laughs> thing to think. But at the time, it was like, you know, this might be enough for her. This might be all she needs to go forward. And so you need to drink her in, listen to everything she says, possibly thought about recording it, um, and then thought, no, that <laughs> is really still Korean. You know. But, yeah, the whole thing felt like a felt like a film I was watching and I could mm. hear my own voice in it but um yeah it was just just a crazy day don't remember the journey home yeah really yeah. special and odd <laughs> almost like an, an out-of-body experience I can like you said but of course it wasn't the last time you saw each other it wasn't just that one moment because you have gone on to have this wonderful relationship with each yeah. other and um I, mean, I know you both and and what always struck me or and and still strikes me is how similar you are do you see those similarities yourself um I do she she looks very much like my dad mm. so and she looks just like my dad when she was born so there was a an almost um it didn't feel like a shock when I first saw her, even in the photograph, because she looked familiar to me. Yeah. But then I did. We did go through a series of trying to find those similarities because it's it's bonding, isn't it? To have similarities with somebody. Yeah. Um, and we, we did the foot cream and, you know, do you like this? Do you like that? But I think it was our sense of humour. Um, and the fact that we both have gone through life with a series of uh, sort of comedic moments that um sometimes make you cry because they're so clumsy and difficult and but often get you through an awkward moment with somebody else so our comedic moments um were, de were definitely bonding but she felt to me very familiar from the beginning from the beginning yeah which i suppose is quite odd really but yeah, I think it's it's her eyes. They're very much like my dad's. So yeah, it was it was like looking at a family member straight away, but with all the emotions of you know this is your child. And it took an enormous amount of courage for Sarah to to search for you, but it's equally taken an, an enormous amount of courage for you to talk about it as well. And it's such a positive and uplifting story. It's got such a lovely happy ending um, about both of you. And I mean, I realise that not everybody has had or would have this this experience like you have had and it's amazing that that you're that you've been so willing to discuss it with me today um uh, and what about the boys did you find any connect any similarities between sarah and the boys yeah def de i mean definitely uh my second son daniel and sarah have definitely got the same uh, and alex my youngest son definitely got the same sense of humour um if you are with them and uh they're all together they bounce off each other um like they've never been apart yeah and I sometimes secretly sort of sit back and just watch them and I get an enormous amount of pleasure from that um I think gosh when they were babies um I used to often wonder you know I wonder if Sarah did that I wonder if Sarah was like that I wonder if Sarah whatever. I mean, I didn't even know if her um, adoptive parents had changed her name. So you wonder, uh, especially with my eldest son, is this what Sarah did? I mean, you know, I'd, mm. I'd sort of gone past peering into prams and wondering if she looked like that at three or... So they're all similar. They're all quite forthright. Mm. And um, don't take any nonsense mm. so and um I'm not particularly like that I don't know where they all get that from because I'm not like that but I think that was one of the things again you look for similarities don't you in a family of course and they are I mean they're, they're seamless when they're together which is just incredible to watch yeah and be a part of um yeah the whole thing is is still a wonder to me. Mm. 
even That's now. Beautiful. That's beautiful. And that first family gathering that Sarah came to, was it your birthday? Yeah, it was. It was your birthday, wasn't yeah. it? Um, uh, a surprise birthday party. That's it. And how was that introducing Sarah to to all of the family, to your extended family and friends? It was fine. I think after my immediate family, after the <clears throat> the, the boys and my sister, anybody else, it was a bonus. Yeah. Um, I've never felt that I had to explain it to anybody else. Mm-hmm. Um, and... I find it easy to call her my daughter. Mm-hmm. So, so that, that was the introduction. This is my daughter. And um, it was quite a busy evening, if I remember rightly. And so nobody asked me any questions. Um, and once I'd had the letter and I told my friend at work, I was telling other people a- about it. So I don't think it was, um, it, it was difficult to talk about at the party. And, and it was lovely that you were there because mm. um, you'd been in the pub for the first um, the first meeting. So, yeah, it, I think it gets easier once you've done the immediate family. Yeah. Yeah. And I think as well, you know, I'm more grown up than I was then. And I don't care what other people think, quite frankly, yeah. as long as we have a relationship and as long as um, my sons and Sarah get on, I don't really care about the judgments anymore I think that probably comes with age well you've got a a beautiful happy ending anyway so yeah who cares if if people are judgy yeah and times have changed haven't they it's not shocking news I, I don't think to people as much nowadays as it was back then and what would you say to if somebody um came to you and they said I want to search for my birth mum I would ask them why I think first of all um because i am aware that you know lots of these sorts of stories don't have happy endings if if they still wanted to do it i mean i would encourage it because our ending's been so good or our story is so good Mm. i think for birth parents for birth mothers because obviously that's what i was i think it's um it a lot of it would depend on the setup Mm -hmm. you know their family setup um it it was such a shameful thing back then that I mean it was all done in such a beautiful way Hayley you know there were there wasn't anybody on the doorstep we had time to get to know each other a little bit Mm -hmm. my boys were just incredible um my sister was beyond excited so everybody was in the right positions I don't know how it would have been had there been any I don't know any resistance from anybody if my boys I don't know hadn't wanted to meet her everybody's story is so different isn't it it's absolutely and it's it's so lovely that from something that was a secret that you that you couldn't talk about that as you said felt shameful and now is something that you can completely celebrate and rejoice and just shout about is just such a wonderful turn of events yeah, it is. And and I'm still telling people about it now. Mm. Because new people come into your life. Um, I mean, it's not the first thing I say to people, you know, my name's Sue and I gave up a child for adoption. But, you know, I told somebody recently who's who I've become quite close to and and her acceptance of it, mm. because times have changed, was just like, it's not really a story then. Do you know what I mean? It was like, no. she was like, oh gosh, that must have been difficult. How are things now? And it was over. So it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel the hurdle that it, it was, you know, when I was in my thirties, you know, yeah. all those years ago. And I think the more it's spoken about, the easier it probably will be for people. It's hard as well, to, you know, to take on board that it often isn't a happy ending for people. And, you know, birth parents have died and how awful that must be and the regret that must be around so so yeah I think I would encourage people to do it with the proviso that they just need to have some support Mm. and um I mean it's it's huge isn't it yeah I definitely think the the support network is paramount really Sarah was lucky she had NORCAP 
it's not running anymore the charity uh, adoption charity that, that, with, that with a mediator and and it just it's just a buffer for both of you yeah. although um the mediator didn't tell me a lot about sarah he was able to reassure me about the anger thing mm. and about you know, she was well and and those sorts of things and i um, I, he gave me his telephone number and he said I could ring at any time so it was always that person had it gone wrong or had we hit a hiccup I could have gone to him they were trained they must have seen a thousand scenarios so he would have been a, a resource to go to that mm -hmm. felt safe. Thank you so much Sue I'm so grateful thank you for your time thank it's you. been well I've been here like in tears listening to the story I, well I'm, I feel so connected to it and 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 to you and obviously to Sarah and it was so wonderful to be to be part of both of your journeys um, especially in those early stages oh, and um, and I really really appreciate you chatting to me thank you you're very welcome thank you Hayley so guys what did you think Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Oh, I need a bit of time. I really do. <laughs> well, I mean, first of all, there was just certain bits that stuck out. I mean, the fact that she said she's so lucky. Um, oh, and just thinking back to it now. But the, the thing that really stuck out in my mind, God, I'm sorry, literally thinking about it. I've tried not to think about it so that I could talk eloquently when she said she just heard her voice and she couldn't hear what she was saying and she just wanted to listen to what she was saying, but she wanted to absorb in the sound of her voice. Yeah, yeah. And how she felt so familiar. Um, mm. It from was the second name. Oh, God, I'm so sorry, Natalie, take over. You're the professional here. <laughs> oh, It got me, actually, as well, when Sue oh. was saying that she just wanted to drink it in. Yeah. listen to her voice look at her face just drink it in because she didn't know if there was going to be another time another visit another That's meeting it. and yeah. if she was angry but they're both very similar you know they're both very pragmatic about it I think Sarah was very pragmatic about it when she was uh, searching for Sue and and you know well this could happen or this could happen and 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 Sue was the same, and I think they're both very similar in that respect. I mean, like you said, we are so honoured, we're so privileged, oh. because it's not a side of of a story that you hear very often. And I just thank Sue for her for her bravery, yes, thank for, you, Sue. for coming on and talking to us. And she's just so eloquent, and you know, so lovely. Could you explain to me a little bit? Sorry, Natalie. I, I, she said that Sarah was given up at six weeks. I'm trying to remember. I know I, I cried through both interviews. So was she with Sarah for six weeks before she just, or? or I'm, I'm not entirely sure. You're not actually. entirely sure. It was just the big, big secret um, that she only had her sister to confide in, which must have just been so demonstrative to mental health and sort of in a in a sort of manifestation of anxiety I mean just mm. nobody should have to go through that alone at any age yeah it's just a beautiful story and it's so wonderful that it was such a happy ending what did you think Natalie I I thought it was beautiful and actually I wanted to ask you Hayley because you were there the day yes um, you, the day they met for yeah. the first time mm. is that right so so when Sue was talking about um her friend being there Sarah also brought her friends along. Yeah, but um, I, I didn't, uh, we didn't meet them at first because no, we were in, no. in different places. But it was, I do remember it being absolutely nerve wracking. So yeah. terrifying because we, we didn't know oh, her. Gosh. We didn't know what she was going to be like. Sarah had spoken to her on the phone and that was it. And obviously you feel very protective for your friend. You you, you desperately want this to be to well. really positive and it's like, okay, it might not go positive. You might have to pick up the pieces. And, you know, it's, it was just a roller coaster of emotions yeah. throughout the day. But then as soon as they came back from their meeting, you just knew that it was going to be great. Oh, just it's just that so it was... heartwarming. I just, when you were saying that then, I just had to breathe a sigh of relief. Because oh, what, a, what, a, what, a, what a relief it must have been for both of them to... Um, for it to go well and for yeah. all of you as well all of the people in their lives that that care for them so deeply and for you after after knowing that it's gone well and um 
Yeah, it must have been. So I love their weird foot cream lovely. thing that they've both yeah, got. That's the little, so the little. <laughs> do. Is it idiosyncrasies that they? It's the whole nature v nurture theory, isn't it? It's yes. So- it's, it's so interesting. Really interesting. And they are really similar. I mean, my kids don't live with their father and my son sometimes walks in and it's like, wow, that, that's, that's inherent. That's, that is nature. That is absolutely categorically not nurture. And it yeah. must just be so extraordinary. And I think, you know, those are other factors that you have to think about when people are giving up children for adoption. It's not a decision that is made lightly. It's not it's not the sort of guilt as well, but it's also the inquisitive d- desire that just must be constantly there. Like, what do they sound like? What do they look like? Mm, I mean, I've got a brother that we've never met. We found out we found out a year ago, my siblings and I, uh, <laughs> that we have a brother, a much younger brother. And we're all a bit weird about it. Um, and uh, because we don't want to upset him because I don't think he knows about us. So it's a bit of a weird one. Um but we did get a photo and I just saw, even in the photo, you could just see, I can really see some kind of mannerisms or just even the way he's walking or holding his baby that is either a bit like my brother, a bit like my sister. I can see me in it. And it is weird. It's spooky. It's so interesting. Um, when Sue was talking about um, they, they were looking for the similarities, I think as people, we do look for those things. And, and, and when you're not, when you when you're not adopted and you and you do grow up with your family um you, you t- i certainly take it for granted like i am the spitting image of my dad facially. Mm, yes you are and i've never known i've i've always known that so it's 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 like a, i've i've got i've got that sense of belonging like the, of knowing where i'm where i'm where I come from and mm. who I come from. So not having that. And that's something that I, I've mentioned long lost family before. And I, I just sob at that program every time I watch it and I watch it with my mum and it's just, Oh, it's such a beautiful program. And I think it's the, it's the, the real life. Um, and when they come together at the end and it's just so, Oh, um, and that's mm. Sue and yeah. and Sarah yeah. in real life. And it's, um, it's just so beautiful, but not knowing where you're from or not knowing like if you have the same nose as someone or where you get your hair color from. And like, health questions so... as well. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. How many times are you asked and when you, well, you're, you're a lot younger, Natalie, but certainly when, you know, you hit 40, you're very much asked, you know, do you have breast cancer in your family, bowel disease, anything like that? And of course, these are things that sometimes I comfort my health anxiety with to sort of say, well, both my parents are quite old and luckily have never been inflicted with any health issues. And it is a comfort to me. So I can imagine if you suffer from health anxiety and you don't know your background, it can, you know, that can be really confusing and up upsetting it was interesting what you say natalie about how much you look like your um your dad apparently there is um there there is a a darwin what is it darwinian how would you say it darwin theory on this darwinian darwinian it's darwinian i didn't Mm. want to sound like a total heathen whilst talking about darwin um but uh my i i didn't grow up with my dad my parents weren't married um, and my dad didn't want me and was very clear about that um but apparently children do look more like their babies when they're their fathers when they're born because this dates back to oh cavemen um, cavemen that they would deny a child if it didn't look like the father Mm -hmm. and so what's so hysterical is i came out looking like a mini version of my dad just without the slightly mullety hair and cowboy boots (sighs) i mean it was just my mum basically said we don't even need a birth certificate to prove this and i think Say with my kids as well, they literally both came out looking like little little mini Greeks, didn't they? But oh god, but, you but, can... <laughs> you can... was a Greek grandma. Yes, but even Amelia to a way, you know, she did look like her father, you know, mm, but yeah. as gradually sort of blossomed and, and and the features have changed a little bit. But I do think there's there is um there's that is a thing. I um that children do look like they're more like their fathers at birth i found that so funny in the interview when uh, sue mentioned how sarah looked just like her dad when when she first came out and i just pictured a baby looking like an old man a bit like benjamin, <laughs> but benjamin they do Button. really i just I think it's look, yes, the babies look like they really do. old ugly people oh. <laughs> hugo looked like a close to retiring jewish accountant who had never seen daylight <laughs> 
But I know that Sarah and Sue both were very aware how it could have gone the other way. Oh, gosh, absolutely. And I think that's why they both really wanted to tell their story, just to highlight the positive and happy sides to it. You can search for your birth mum, your birth parents, and, and it can have a happy ending. And, it, you know, it's it's a difficult process and you need to have support. And, and Sarah did it through a charity called NORCAP, which unfortunately isn't running anymore. But there is Adoption UK, I think, another charity that you can use. And they have mediators, trained mediators that can help and support you through this process. And Sue mentions it as well. If you're going to look for your for your birth family, then please do have support. Mm. Doing it yourself via Facebook probably isn't the best way to do it it may seem like oh a really quick fix but actually going through the right channels and Mm. a a tried and tested way where you've got a mediator that makes contact first is a really safe way for both you as an adopted child and the birth parent to make safe contact with each other Um, so I would urge anyone that is thinking about it to go down the proper channels and we will put um, notes in the show notes, some, some details in the show notes. Hi, birds, it's Stephen here. I'm sorry I couldn't join you this week on the podcast. I'm in fact in sunny Northern Ireland on a dairy farm. Don't ask, um, but if you do hear mooing in the background, it's not me. But I just wanted to say how wonderful it was to hear Sue's side of the story and how important it was for us and everybody listening to hear that because we were so lucky to have heard from Sarah um, and her experience as being uh, having been adopted and then finding her, her first mother or birth mother. But also how uh, wonderful it was to hear Sue's side of the story because, like she said, everybody involved have a di- had a different perception of the process. And it was lovely to hear hers. And she was so humbled and grateful that her her experience was positive, but also she respected and understood that that's not always the case uh, for everybody involved. I appreciate how lucky she is. Um, And I just, I was so moved by everything that she said, because life isn't always about happy endings, but there are some out there and it's always worth celebrating those when we hear them. And I'm so, so happy that Sarah has extended her family even further and Sue has done the same as well. What a beautiful story. Thank you, Hayley, for for bringing bringing it to light and to speaking to them both and thank you Sarah and Sue for such a wonderful wonderful story and telling it and um, being so open and and honest about it. Did you cry Natalie? I had tears in my eyes yeah it was because you're quite hard Natalie's quite a tough cookie. No I am not. Are you a crier? I, I cry every single day. Me too. Really? Okay, okay, maybe not every day. But, okay. Um, so what? What's I over? Is it and therapy? Very easily. I'm. I have. I have a huge amount of empathy in my bo- mm. in my bones, and I just em- anything, anything like old people eating. Oh God. Yes. Yeah. On old, their own. Old on men. Their own. Cro- old men crossing the road. Oh, oh stop God. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, everything. Um, like I cry. At, like Love Island. <laughs> I've never watched Love Island, but yeah, I would. I always used to cry at uh, Cilla Black. Surprise, surprise! Oh, yeah. I mean, that was just like I only had to hear her singing it, and it was like, oh, I'm gone. I'm and gone. you do realise, Natalie, you'll get worse once you've had children. I now cry at adverts. Oh, I've yeah. always cried at adverts. Yeah. Really interesting that you think I'm hard, though. Well, no, I just always thought you really had your shit together. I genuinely did. And you're not... (laughs) I think you're a brilliant actress, but actually I know a lot of actresses and they're quite full-on emotionally. And I think you're, you're very grounded I, I mean that as a total compliment because Thank I've, you. I've yeah, that is honestly cool. because you just seem so you clearly have a very stable um family life and that radiates from you your love with your family is so special yeah. and I, I'm yeah. very jealous of that I'm also very jealous of Ryan uh, <laughs> that's for other reasons but yeah I think that a lot there's a lot to be said about your the way you probably have have your conduct your relationship with Ryan based on what you grew up and the respect you saw at home and the love and yeah. it's, that's what I mean it's it's a chain isn't it yeah, a cycle I think, yeah I think it is and I think also having been trained as an actor for so long uh, for so many years and training to um, you know put my mind into so many other people's um, 
you mm. know personas and everything and all the training I've gone through that has definitely most definitely like almost made me who I am today and mm. and maybe even more so than that um is the the life coaching that I did that mm. I've been doing over the last mm. year a uh, year and a half um with um my life coach who I speak about on on the podcast a little bit and yeah that's just I've I've grown so much as a person and I'm um yeah, I, you I exude just... really positive energy. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Like you are a shiny, happy person in my thought, eyes. Yeah. I never feel I never feel oppressed in your presence. <laughs> or I know you can always lighten a mood. Or you've got a really like it's a real gift, Natalie. You've got a, that just a lovely energy. And you too, actually, Haley. You've just both got yeah. really good energy. But you. But you both have really solid, lovely family backgrounds. You spend a lot of time with your families. You go and visit your families over the summer. I, you know, Haley, you and your mum are so close, mm. and you've got a brilliant relationship with everyone in your family. And um, from what from what I know, um, and I, I just think it, it shines through you both. You're just very, very, very decent humans. And I, I don't mean so. It's not like oh, I'm surprised you cried. I just you always come across very, very happy, Natalie. Really, sort of just. <laughs> full of enthusiasm and I love it it's just such energy and can I just say the reason that you are away at the moment go on what are you doing <laughs> I, yeah so I'm not at my usual recording place I'm up I'm up north up north um I'm doing a pantomime and um, oh no she isn't <laughs> oh yes I am <laughs> You've been you practicing that, that line. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah I've been waiting uh, I love it where where can people find you I'm going to be performing Robin Hood at the Lawrence Batley Theatre in Huddersfield. It's just had a gorgeous renovation and it's... it's I've heard really it's a lovely cool. little theatre. Oh, have you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. My, uh, I've got friends in Huddersfield. Oh, okay. I will Should send them. Up? I Get will them send them your way, Maid Marion. Yeah, please. Maid Marion, yes. And yeah. Natalie is Maid Marion and we're all going to... I'm Try. sassy as well. I have that for, course, for my whole life. I've are. played. I've played like the girl next door, and and this time I'm being a sassy maid, Marion. So it's really exciting for me to sort of get into that. Into well, that funnily enough, sassiness. I I don't. I think that um, I did a adaptation of um, Robin Hood or something. But I don't know if you heard my interview with Maya last week. But we met doing panto. And I was, I think I was Maid Marian and she was Robin Hood, but like, I was a real sort of slut and she was like a sort of <laughs> sexy, What's it was new? just the weird, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm joking. But we were talking about the weird casting of a panto we met in. Yeah, yeah so I'm glad Marian's sassy. Yeah, she has to be. Yeah. She, yeah. She's got to deal with all the merry men. And yeah. being married and, and being dating a socialist yeah, <laughs> or a yeah. communist or whatever Robin Hood is classed as. <laughs> and the sheriff of Nottingham. Oh, yeah. That, that, sheriff. That one. Lovely listeners, please go and check out our Four Calling Birds store page. We've got a range of new Christmas jumpers coming out, um, which is really exciting. They're all organic, eco-friendly and pretty damn awesome. Um, you can find them at www.fourcallingbirds.store. Oh, yeah. I think you'd look very, very good in a, your filthy animal sweatshirt, now. <laughs> <laughs> my absolute favorite that christmas jumper i love yeah. it i'm definitely gonna I... get but don't forget you can see all our jumpers and all what we're up to on our socials the best place to find us i reckon is probably instagram at four calling birds underscore podcast and also the store at four calling birds underscore store and that is the letter the letter sorry the number four um, <laughs> and also find us on twitter and facebook but i would say Go to Instagram. We've got our link tree in our bio. You can find everything we've done there. And also all the information is always in the show notes. Thank you for listening. And a huge thanks to Stu for this week's episode. Check out the store. Check out our socials. And we'll see you next time. Bye. 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 <laughs>